So start recording. So we're introducing our uh, high school classmate for most of us, David, uh, a denizen resident of Stanton Avenue near their firehouse and a long time, uh, I guess you were pretty much born there in Stanton Heights, right? Or you lived in that house most of your life and now celebrating his uh, 69th birthday today. So we appreciate David coming forward and volunteering to do this. Uh, uh, I think you'll find a very interesting, the wonderful world of wire. So with that, I'm gonna tur turn it over to, uh, now let's do the happy birthday first. Okay, everybody ready? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. That way we All record right. the happy birthday. Ready? <laughs> One, a two, a three, happy, happy birthday, birthday to, to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you. Okay, that's probably the most off-key rendition <laughs> of ever. And now it's recorded it's for us. He waited 69 years for that. <laughs> All right. So we'll go ahead and ask everyone to mute. And David, we're just going to turn it over to you so you can start the presentation. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak to you. It's It's been a very interesting uh, career, I must say. I never thought that... Uh, I would be doing the things that I, you know, have been doing. I'm sure many of you have the same sentiments about your, uh, you know, endeavors and you know how th how life turned out for you. Uh, let's start this. Um, there we go. So I'm uh, I am now in the wire industry, uh, primarily uh, ferrous wire, steel. Uh, uh, somewhat uh, also into the uh, non fair section. And, you know, wire goes back many, many years, centuries, and I'll get into that in a few minutes. And this is an example of how they used to draw wire, but uh, let's uh, move on. Well, from uh, the very beginning, I've always wanted to be a chemist. I don't know why, but um, I was always interested in science, chemistry in particular. It might have had some, I might have been influenced by uh, a cousin uh, who turned out to be an astrophysicist, much like uh, Gary. Uh, but I started off at Sunnyside and then uh, went down the hill to uh, Morningside for two years. Went, uh, went to uh, Peabody, of course, and, you know, I tried to participate in, you know, the science clubs and chemistry clubs at, you know, the schools. I then uh, went off to uh, the University of Pittsburgh, where I spent uh, six years uh, studying chemistry, winding up with a, a master's degree. Uh, the original chemistry building was up on the hill and the new one, the Chevron Science Center was uh, completed in uh, 1973. And I had a distinction of helping my uh, research advisor move into this building and coordinated the efforts. He, at that time, the chemistry department was spread out all over the campus. There were even we, uh, they were even using uh, Mellon Institute, and my uh, research advisor was located there, and I uh, helped him uh, get uh, situated on the uh, the top floor of uh, the chemistry building. My career has taken an interesting path. It uh, started off in Pittsburgh at uh, a company in Verona. Uh, called Farbest, and they were involved with uh, steel and aluminum rolling oils for making steel sheet and uh, aluminum sheet, including aluminum foil. Uh, I stayed there for about nine years and then moved to upstate New York, uh, Cortland, New York, 
And th that was an interesting experience. I was going through a divorce, but, and, you know, it just helped me to, you know, reset myself. Now, the other thing was that was interesting that uh, while I was there, the company had three takeovers. So even though uh, I had moved, I had worked for uh, the three companies that you see, uh, Penwald, Addo, uh, Chem, Adofina, and then that group was sold to Hankel. So between the four of them, I spent 22 years in that organization. Uh, after Hankel divested themselves of the uh, metalworking group that I was a part of, I joined uh, Blatchford, and they're located in uh, Mississauga, Ontario, but they also have a facility in uh, Frankfurt, Illinois, outside of uh, Chicago. So, you know, it, as I said, it's been a uh, an interesting uh, career. Now, some of the things I got involved with, uh, uh, there we go, was, uh, at uh, far best, uh, I helped to develop a lubricant, a rolling uh, oil uh, for making uh, you know, beer can stock. Now, the history behind that is, is that Alcoa Aluminum, working with another uh, lubricant company, had developed a means of rolling aluminum using uh, water solutions. Aluminum, uh, it can be very reactive. You don't normally think of that, but aluminum uh, in its uh, nasian form without any oxide coating will rapidly uh, react with water. And that had been the big bugaboo for many, many years as other competitors, you know, tried to duplicate what Alcoa was doing. Uh, I finally came up with a uh, solution and it was used for many years to, uh, to help make those uh, beer can uh, tops. At uh, Elfato Chem, uh, I developed a, uh, dr a drawing lubricant, also aqueous based, that was used for making uh, staples. There they needed uh, very clean wire uh, in order for the adhesive that holds the staples uh, together. Now, also at Adochem, I uh, worked on a project to improve uh, the manufacturing process of, uh, the, uh, of our dry powdered lubricants. This is what the uh, lubricants uh, normally look like. They're very uh, powdery. And this is what I uh, you know, uh, developed uh, was this uh, pellet uh, technology. Uh, in, at very small sizes. Uh, the prior art uh, from one, actually from the uh, competitor I'm now working for, they were only able to make a, a 2.6 millimeter uh, diameter, which was extremely hard. Whereas the uh, pellets I developed uh, were softer and a lot smaller and customers uh, really liked them. And from that work, I uh, received a patent. I've been uh, <clears throat> involved in a number of associations as well as I have uh, done you know, some publishing uh, in these uh, trade journals, a couple of my uh, articles. I also, uh, you know, uh, had you know, presentations uh, this particular article, you can see me uh, giving a, a presentation. And what's interesting about this one, uh, this was done at the uh, David L. Lawrence Convention Center. And that was uh, kind of fun to uh, show my colleagues in and around the city, especially uh, going up Mount Washington on the uh, incline. Uh, we also went to uh, Permani Brothers in the Strip. And, you know, everybody just had a, a good old time. Uh, you know, at this uh, convention. A few more of my articles that, you know, uh, are referenced. And uh, finally, this is probably one of my more uh, 
enjoyable uh, experiences or uh, not so much experiences, but accomplishments. And I got a, a, a communication from uh, Professor Erg uh, Enhang from uh, Sweden. He's at the uh, like an Applied Materials Technology uh, Mauter Technik in Sweden. And he had uh, seen a number of my presentations at the Wire Association and was intrigued with my, res uh, with my uh, presentations that he wanted to include some of them into this uh, steel wire technology, which is a uh, reference uh, handbook for the steel, in, you know, the steel wire industry, uh, one of two. And so I got the uh, chance to uh, work with him. I contributed you know, several uh, sections, in, uh, including this uh, section here, which is on thermal analysis of our uh, products. And he, of course, gave me a uh, reference and a uh, signed copy. So as I said, that's one of my more prouder uh, moments. And, you know, uh, mentioning uh, presentations, uh, I, uh, you know, do quite a few for the Wire Association International. I'm one of the routine instructors uh, on lubrication at the uh, conventions that were held every year. Plus, we're now doing a uh, virtual presentation. Well, I'm sorry, not a virtual, but we were also doing an off-show uh, or an off-show educational course in the fall. And, you know, I would be, uh, you know, one of the speakers. And if you notice down here, I'm one of the poster boys at this point on the, uh, the advertisement. <laughs> now, with this... Uh, uh, career, I've been able to visit many, many countries. And these are outlined or noted, uh, you know, on this map. And presentations in uh, Bogota, presentations in uh, Venezuela. And this was an interesting uh, presentation. I was given about uh, a 30-day uh, notice. Maybe it was 45. But uh, we were at a convention in Thailand, which is about five hours from uh, Shanghai. And I, uh, we flew back through Shanghai, and this was for the Ecological Development Union International. And the people who I was speaking to were the local government officials, and they wanted information on how they might uh, better control uh, the environment uh, from uh, the wire drawing uh, chemicals that are being that were were and are being used. So again, this is a list of the uh, various countries that I have, uh, you know, worked in. Uh, you know, doing both. Uh, you know, and I go either to the customer facilities. Uh, I uh, also you know work as you can tell you know in uh, foreign countries. And I also instruct uh, new uh, distributors on the use of our products. Now, one of the, uh, my early trips was to uh, actually Melbourne, uh, in which I helped to start up our chemical plant down there for making these uh, wire drawing powders. And I uh, wanted to give you a little bit of trivia here. This is the uh, Harbor Bridge in Sydney. Now, you would be surprised that uh, Paul Hogan, a.k.a. Crocodile Dundee, was one of the original painters of this bridge before he uh, went on to uh, you know, bigger and better things. I thought <laughs> that was quite interesting. While in uh, Bogota, uh, I was able to um, you know, see... Uh, a uh, salt cathedral. Now, Bogota is about uh, six to seven thousand. No, I'm sorry, about eight thousand feet above sea level. Yet they have a very thriving uh, salt industry, and 
one of the uh, early predecessors of the company I was working for, Penwalt, started their business as Penn Salt, uh, mining salt and then converting it into uh, bleach, sodium hypochlorite. This is a restaurant that uh, uh, was, well, this is a salt, uh, what do you want to say, it? Uh, refinery uh, location where, you know, they would uh, get the brine, boil the water off, and you're left with these salt crystals. This was converted into a uh, restaurant. And then uh, close by is one of the salt mines. And one of the things that they believe in doing is they leave enough salt in a pillar so that they can place and carve a, uh, a Christian cross into it as a, a good luck charm for the miners uh, who are uh, working there. Some other uh, uh, interesting uh, visits. Uh, here uh, I'm uh, participating with uh, having a fresh uh, sugar cane juice. Uh, this is, a, as you can see, a roadside stand. We stop. He cuts open the sugar cane, pours it into a glass, and you uh, drink it. <laughs> uh, over on this other picture, we've got, uh, uh, oh, help me here. You know, at 69, I'm losing my mind. If you happen to find it, uh, please send it home to me. Uh, what's, oh, mangoes. These are uh, a mango stand, and we were buying fresh mangoes. And then the bottom picture, I don't know what it is about uh, foreigners, uh, and I'm sure other people who have uh, traveled overseas uh, and spent some time there, uh, you find that the foreigners like to come up and take your picture or have their picture taken with you. And this was uh, no different. In uh, Mexico, I uh, had the chance to uh, go to uh, Tio. T. Watkin, which is a uh, Mesoamerican uh, pyramid uh, uh, site. And this is about 45 minutes outside of Mexico City. Uh, what we're looking at uh, in the, uh, the first picture is the uh, Pyramid of the uh, Sun. And at uh, the bottom here, you can see that uh, I am at the top and they have placed a copper rod at the very top of the, uh, at the apex of this pyramid. And if you touch it, you're supposed to receive uh, positive energy. Uh, the one on the uh, right here is the pyramid of the moon. And this one shows, you know, the relative, uh, you know, closeness of the two. This is the uh, pyramid of the moon. I'm sorry, this is the pyramid of the sun. And I'm on top of the Pyramid of the Moon, uh, as you can see over here. And this is referred to as the Avenue of the Dead. And there's actually an, uh, another uh, pyramid at this site called the, uh, the Serpent uh, Pyramid. Uh, it's not quite as uh, friendly to get to, but it is you know, also very interesting. Uh, in Korea, very interesting uh, country. You know, just seeing the, you know, the pomp and circumstances of, you know, uh, the changing of a guard at the uh, the castle or at the palace, uh, going to the various uh, Buddhist uh, monk uh, Buddhist monasteries, trying the local food. Uh, I hope you like squid, or is that octopus? That may be octopus. And you know, I just find the. You know, the Orient, you know, such a, uh, an interesting place. Uh, this is uh, Taipei. And this is, uh, there is a city outside of Taipei at the, uh, the mouth of the uh, Yellow Sea and the uh, Tamsui River. And this was a, a British outpost back in the uh, 19th century. And uh, this outpost was used to uh, control the uh, trade and the traffic uh, coming into uh, Taipei. Uh, interesting restaurant, world famous uh, for their uh, dim sum. 
Uh, they do have uh, worldwide locations. I think one of them is uh, in uh, California, if you're out that way. And then I found a new way of uh, barbecuing meat at one of the uh, night markets, a uh, 50,000 BTU uh, propane torch. Uh, certainly uh, is uh, light and uh, easy to uh, carry, you know, carry along on any uh, trip. Thailand was another interesting uh, country. Uh, the Buddhists have a philosophy that they never, you know, if they build something, they never tear it down. They let it go back to nature. And what you see here is a, uh, a statue, a Buddhist statue that has been overrun by a uh, banyan tree. And they refer to this as the uh, statue in the tree, very famous. Uh, also, I had the opportunity before it was shut down uh, for humanitarian purposes of uh, visiting the Tiger Temple and, you know, getting up and close uh, and personal uh, with this uh, three-month-old uh, tiger and then with this uh, three-week-old tiger that was still nursing. And, of course, uh, We've all heard of the uh, the bridge over the River Kwai. Well, in the background is the bridge over the River Kwai, actually one of two bridges. Uh, there was a wooden bridge that the uh, British did destroy. And eventually this bridge was also destroyed by bombing. It was uh, rebuilt from reprep, repaper, please help me here, re uh, pre reparations from the Japanese government after the war. Also in Thailand, you know, the art is just magnificent. You see gold everywhere from their buildings to the paintings inside of the uh, monasteries to the statues. Uh, here's another banyan tree uh, overgrowing into a uh, small uh, Buddhist uh, temple. This is the inside of the temple. Uh, what's interesting, uh, I'm not sure you can really see it, but uh, if you look closely, there is small little pieces of gold leaf that the locals will uh, place on the uh, Buddha or on the statue as good luck for uh, any number of uh, life uh, events. And so over a period of time, uh, the gold leaf just uh, keeps getting heavier and heavier. This is... Uh, Another area of uh, Thailand, this is actually in the uh, city of uh, Ayutthaya, Thailand. This is where the uh, summer palace is located, but these are uh, Buddhist uh, temples. Now, what's interesting about Ayu, uh, Ayutthaya, you can read it for yourself, is this is the city in which the story of the king and I uh, took place, which is a actual uh, story. I never did get to the actual palace. I wasn't dressed appropriately. Uh, in Thailand, they are very strict with uh, government uh, locations that you must be dressed appropriately. And wearing shorts was not considered appropriate. Outside of these uh, venues, there'll be little vendors, you know, selling you uh, wraparounds or you know, so that you're uh, going in, uh, you know, in a modest fashion. Now, what I wanted to show you here, that, that, that this is actually a uh, mausoleum. And if you uh, climb up the, uh, I don't know, number of steps and you get inside, there's another set of steps that takes you down to the crypt. And this is probably about 40 or 50 foot drop. Now at the bottom, um, you can barely see it, there is a small chamber that you have to climb into. And once you climb into it, you see these wonderful old frescoes. And this is the top, uh, this is the ceiling of that crypt. People who don't like to uh, explore are missing, you know, amazing things. And I'm glad I uh, decided I was going to explore and Head down those steps. Of course, uh, 
I've been to uh, Europe. Uh, uh, I think that, well, the most recent time was a uh, about six years ago. And we, uh, my ex and myself, we went to the uh, Laka uh, cave where, you know, to see the, uh, uh, the uh, cave drawings. Very, very interesting. This is uh, man's early art. Over in Bordeaux, I found this interesting statue, and it's uh, a it's made by a uh, an artist uh, Jean uh, Palenza. French isn't too good, uh, but he calls the Sanya, and he has made a number of these that he has uh, installed uh, around the world, and it's strict. I think uh, it translates to face. If somebody is more literate in French than I am, I'm barely literate in American. Uh, you can correct me after uh, <laughs> later on. Uh, other places in uh, Europe include uh, Copenhagen, where I uh, found the, uh, the Hans Christian Andersen uh, statue. Uh, in Madrid, Spain, I thought this was interesting statue, uh, sort of <laughs> an accidental uh, discovery where it looks like this lady, uh, this child, is looking purposely at this pigeon who just happenstancely is sitting on uh, the woman's uh, thigh. And then uh, in another place, I actually found uh, Don Quixote and his uh, faithful servant, uh, uh, was it Sancho? Uh, somebody uh, click in, maybe. Uh, Kern in uh, outside of Dusseldorf is uh, Kern or uh, Cologne, as uh, we say it. Beautiful. Pancho Sanchez. I'm sorry, say that again, Ryan. It was Pancho Sanchez. Pancho Sanchez. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, in Cologne, you have the magnificent uh, cathedral. Uh, and in uh, Dusseldorf, in the Altstadt, the old city, is the Rhine River. And this is at sunset. And I you know, thought this was a, uh, you know, a very interesting view. We have uh, wire shows in uh, Dusseldorf every other year. So I've been there you know, a number of times. Uh, in, I've been to uh, Stockholm, <laughs> coincidentally, uh, near the uh, summer solstice, where it doesn't get dark. Well, actually, it never gets dark. It only gets twilight at about uh, uh, three o'clock in the morning, and then it's sunrise again <laughs> at about five. Whereas at the winter solstice in December, and I was there just before then, uh, it doesn't get light until about uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock or 10, 10, 30. But then again, it's uh, dark at 2, 2, 30. Maybe you can understand why there's a lot of depression in uh, the uh, Nordic uh, countries. <laughs> China is another interesting oriental city that I've been to uh, uh, numerous times, too many to count at this point. Uh, I've been, you know, uh, this is the uh, Pudong River in Shanghai. There is the Shanghai Tower, which I, over my many trips, I've uh, watched it, uh, you know, get uh, completed. And of course, yeah, you can't go to China without visiting its uh, mascot. The, uh, uh, again, I'm uh, the pandas. Uh, yes. The pandas. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Keep keep your speaker uh, keep your mic on. <laughs> okay. Uh, in uh, Beijing, I uh, was able to uh, visit uh, Tiananmen Square, and there is an interesting uh, placard uh, we have in the United States. You know, uh, uh, ceremonial or history uh, identification placards along roads or in the uh, the uh, back country. Uh, describing an important event. Well, they too also have one across the street from Tiananmen Square about the uprising uh, that took place. Uh, and it's quite interesting. I didn't take a picture of it because I was concerned 
uh, I was being watched and I didn't want to create any waves in a uh, communist uh, country. But in essence, it was describing how Western influence uh, and uh, sedation was the cause for that uprising and uh, not the uh, the Chinese government itself being uh, having a heavy hand. Uh, on another trip, purely for pleasure, I took my granddaughter, who has uh, Chinese uh, relatives uh, uh, that live in Taiwan, and I took her uh, to both the uh, Forbidden City, the Imperial Palace, and also up to the uh, Great Wall of China, which uh, she thoroughly enjoyed. Now, this is uh, some interesting information about an area of Shanghai that uh, would be interesting to mainly my Jewish friends, but also I'm sure uh, it does have uh, some meaning to uh, you know, my uh, uh, Christian and uh, Gentile friends, and that is the uh, Jewish ghetto. Now, the Jewish ghetto was created just before World War II when Hitler started persecuting the Jews in uh, Western Europe. They found that the only way to survive, well, one of the ways to survive was to get out of Germany or out of uh, Western Europe, but not many countries were willing to take them, all except uh, China. Now, China at that time, uh, was now under the occupation of the Japanese, but they welcomed the Jewish population uh, into a area of uh, Shanghai, which coincidentally also had older Jewish communities that had been uh, established in the uh, late uh, 19th century uh, by a gentleman who has the last name of uh, Sassoon, uh, I hope that name sounds familiar to everybody. Uh, but Sassoon was an Iranian Jew who was also a, a trader. And he initially set up a, a trading post uh, in uh, New Delhi, uh, India. And that oh, was so trader. Trader. I'm, sorry, I trader? trader. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you, uh, Rana. I said trader. I thought you meant traitor. I was embarrassed. Oh. For it. <laughs> I, I thought I said traitor also. <laughs> uh, I have a hard time speaking American also. Uh, but uh, anyhow, so he was very successful. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so soon, yeah, so soon was very successful in uh, India. And Shanghai was opening up to be a global financial center where uh, the uh, British, the French, uh, and the uh, the Dutch all had small colonies and uh, sections in Shanghai, and it was no different uh, for the uh, the Jewish population. Uh, as uh, Sassoon moved into Shanghai, he brought his family. The family brought friends, and pretty soon you had a very vibrant Jewish community. Uh, the second wave of Jewish immigration to Shanghai occurred in the early 20th century during the Russian pogrom. And again, those people uh, found a welcoming home in uh, Shanghai and moved there. So when the third emigration started from uh, Europe during uh, uh, prior to World War II, you already had these two Jewish uh, settlements. Now, as we all know uh, who are Jewish and come from different uh, ethnic, uh, you know, the, uh, the Poles, the Polish Jews don't like talking to the Romanian Jews, the Romanian Jews don't like talking to the, uh, the uh, Western Jews, uh, the Sephardic, you know, everybody, you know, just doesn't like to talk. And that was somewhat the case in uh, Shanghai, where the Iranian Jews, you know, uh, did not try to associate themselves very closely with the, uh, the Russian Jews. However, when the Western European Jews uh, from uh, Poland and uh, Romania and uh, Germany uh, arrived, 
they took them in and helped them uh, start a, a new life there, even though it was going to be a lot rougher than the lives that the existing Jewish population uh, was enjoying. Uh, let me... Now, one of the uh, more interesting things that came out of the, all of this, as I said, Shanghai was under the control of the Japanese. The Jap uh, Hitler wanted the return of the uh, Western Jews to face uh, persecution. Remember, he was trying to annihilate the uh, Jewish population. And the uh, Japanese government stalled and would not bow to uh, Hitler's uh, demands. And I find this interesting, and I, uh, I've heard this a couple of times, that one of the reasons that the Japanese protected the Jews, even though the Jews were confined to the Jewish ghetto, it wasn't as strict a confinement that there was in Europe, was that during the uh, Russian Japanese War in the early 20th century, Jewish financiers helped to finance the Japanese war cause. So in appreciation of that, the Japanese uh, you know, tried to protect the Jewish population in Shanghai. Now, during the heyday in uh, Shanghai, there were five synagogues. Uh, this is the only one that really exists anymore. All the synagogues were taken over by the Chinese government during uh, Mao's uh, purge of uh, Western culture and made into office uh, build, government office buildings. But this one has been uh, given back as a, a memorial and has been uh, refurbished uh, and brought you know, back to what it looked like uh, when it was being used in the uh, 20s and 30s. This is the uh, Moshe, uh, yeah, I believe it's the uh, the Moshe, uh, yeah, it, you can read it down here. Again, uh, my mind, my memory's not too good. Uh, here is, you know, a, a Passover a Seder, a meal among the uh, the Jewish population. These are the uh, the tickets that were issued to uh, the Jewish uh, immigrants in Europe, you know, to get them over to Shanghai. And uh, there is a large museum there, you know, of just uh, these kind of relics. Now, one another interesting thing is I don't re know if anybody remembers uh, uh, Michael Blumenthal. He was the Treasury Secretary under uh, President Carter's administration. But uh, uh, Michael Blumenthal actually grew up in the Jewish ghetto, and this is his home uh, where he grew up. And there is a uh, plaque to memorialize uh, both the, uh, the Jewish refugees as well as uh, Michael Blumenthal. Now, again, for those who do a lot of uh, uh, global traveling, you know, you find that, uh, you know, your colleagues become friends, you meet other friends, and these uh, become friends for life. And that's certainly, you know, the same uh, with me. And I'm, uh, that's a, one of my uh, biggest fortunes is to have been able to meet all these people around the world. Uh, it sometimes comes in very handy. If you remember the 2010 uh, volcanic eruption in Iceland, which shut down all the air traffic uh, between Europe and the United States. Well, at that time I was in Dusseldorf for the uh, wire show and it was nearly impossible to uh, get home unless you went very far south. Well, having friends in the area, you know, I was able to contact them, this one in particular, he's from uh, the Netherlands, and he was going to help me uh, at least stay over until, you know, I could get a ticket uh, back home. Uh, as I said, you know, once you make, uh, once you work with these people and you 
uh, make friends, you know, they're friends for life. So getting on to what is wire. I told you about my background. Now I'm gonna show you and talk to you about the industry that I have been involved with for over 35 years. And we're gonna start with uh, this uh, uh, segment by showing how wire uh, starts. This is called uh, rod, hot rod. And let's see, uh, there we go. This is a short video showing how the rod comes out of a uh, heating furnace, goes through a number of uh, rolling mills, shoots down the line, goes into more mills to reduce it, and then finally comes out as a coil. It's moving. There you go. Now it's on a cooling belt. Now, as you can see, this uh, mill is probably in India. Uh, the United States mills are much more modern and uh, cleaner looking. And it gets put onto, uh, made into coils, which are then offloaded and turned into coils stored out in a uh, yard. And it's these coils that then, uh, you know, are the start of wire. Now, not too long ago on the program, uh, how things are made. Oh, there we are. Come on. Why isn't this working? I had another video which was supposed to be in here. It's not working. Anyways, I was going to show you how wire drawing is actually done. And unfortunately, uh, I've lost the video. Okay, well, let's move on. Say la vie. Here I am uh, helping to uh, evaluate uh, some new uh, products. And that's uh, a rolling mill, but I was hoping to show you you know, something a little bit more uh, about, you know, the, uh, the process. So now comes the uh, crux of my uh, presentation in that uh, I wanted to show the, you know, the beauty of wire, how wire, you know, uh, makes our lives uh, more uh, enjoyable, you know, both from an entertainment uh, standpoint, as well as artistic, as well as utilitarian. I also wanted to show how wire can be taken from scrap and made into something very artistic. Uh, this image here is the elevator rope from the Taipei 101 uh, skyscraper. And this rope has to be changed every five years. Uh, the rope has to uh, traverse uh, uh, over uh, almost 1,700 uh, feet. There is probably 10 or 11 ropes per elevator car. So there is quite a bit of uh, scrap when they have to replace it. But this ingenious uh, uh, sculpture was able to make something very enjoyable. Also find uh, wired to be uh, very utilitarian, especially in uh, construction. Uh, this is the, uh, the 10th Street uh, Bridge. This is what is referred to as a suspended bridge. And all these uh, guides uh, are connect our wire and are uh, holding up the deck with wire. Now, there are thousands of strands of wire in each one of these uh, sections, like, uh, you know, a cable. And this uh, technique is quite old, but uh, a, a guy by the name of Roblin, you may have heard of him, uh, he helped to uh, build the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. And he was also the architect of the Smithfield Street Bridge. Now, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge is one of the 
earliest uses of wire to make a suspended bridge. And this is a smaller example of a suspended bridge uh, in our uh, neighborhood. And these are, you know, support trusses, uh, again, made from wire uh, that hold up the roof at the Shanghai uh, airport. Barbed wire helped to tame the uh, Wild West. But uh, an interesting, uh, everything is interesting to me. I'm sorry, uh, I keep repeating that word. There are collectors who go around looking for the various types of barbed wire. As you can see, they are all very different and have a certain uh, beauty to them. And of course, we all know about uh, cyclone fencing that helps to, you know, uh, you know, uh, separate properties or are used to, uh, you know, uh, made into uh, dog kennels as this one is here in my backyard. Now I did indicate at the very beginning that wire is a very old art showing you, you know, uh, how they used to make the wire through that uh, uh, draw, uh, plate. This is jewelry, which was the earliest uses of uh, wire that was found in the uh, the baths in Bath, England, and these go back to about the fourth and fifth century. Wire drawing goes back even further, uh, probably three or four thousand years uh, before this. Of course, we have wire that helps to bring uh, beauty to the ear. Uh, some of these people you may or may not uh, recognize. Uh, we have here uh, our good friend, uh, Richard Franklin, uh, playing his guitar with uh, steel strings. We've got uh, Greg Rosen with his uh, friend, uh, Mick Summer, also playing the guitar with steel strings. We all remember Harry, if we went, if you were at the reunion, uh, we wound up going to, what was that King Fly, uh, Robert? And Harry was playing uh, his piano with steel strings. And it's possible that uh, some of those strings were made by a customer of mine called uh, Mapes Piano Spring, located in Elizabethtown, uh, Tennessee. Uh, I know this person, uh, uses some Mapes uh, uh, wire. Uh, this is my cousin, uh, Jeffrey Moydell, who also happens to be Wendy Moydell's youngest brother. He is a professional uh, pianist. And then over here is another cousin to my uh, first cousin, uh, Carol Lewick, who was from the class of uh, 64. Some of you may uh, know uh, Carol. Uh, maybe not. Here are some other uh, examples of uh, wire use uh, that I have seen uh, in my travels. Uh, you don't see maybe a lot of wire here. That's because uh, a lot of that wire is hidden. It's hidden as welding wire. And uh, my, our, my biggest customer, Lincoln Electric is uh, the world's leading producer of uh, welding consumables, uh, AKA uh, welding wire. So that's uh, the glue that holds our uh, society together, so to speak. And then we have uh, the Eisenhower Memorial Tapestry. This tapestry has, was woven with stainless steel wire. And you can see the intricacies of that weaving and the size of this tapestry on the um, uh, memorial. You know, some other uh, interesting pieces that I have uh, seen primarily at wire shows, but also, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, research uh, are these, uh, hold on to your dreams. Uh, both the flowers and the 
uh, the Turkish. Uh, okay, uh, Rana, help me here again. These are the uh, whirling. Oh, the whir whirling, whirling dervishes. Dervish. Yeah, whirly dervish. You can see how intricate, you know, these uh, uh, sculptors are, and you know the fineness of the wire is amazing. If you've ever seen that fine a wire manufactured, you have the to flowers, have a mess mess wire that I've played with a lot too. Yes. And it's fun and quite pliable. Oh yeah. Here are some more sculptures using uh, wire. This one is uh, uh, by Annie uh, Glass. Again, very whimsical. Here are some others uh, from the uh, Tower of London, from the uh, uh, the wire show, and then this is a, a cougar, you know, by uh, Ruth Jensen. And when I'm out and about, I'd like to find pieces of artwork that I could possibly display of. Uh, Art work uh, using wire. Uh, the first one uh, on the left is uh, Karen uh, Fitzgerald's uh, work of art. Uh, in case you don't recognize the wire that's being used, uh, that's nothing more than fireplace screen that she was able to uh, recycle into a uh, a piece of uh, artwork. And then uh, while we were at the uh, the King Fly, is that right, Robert? Just shake your head. Uh, <laughs> uh, I met uh, Susan Wagner. Now, Susan Wagner is also the sculptor that made the three statues down at uh, uh, PNC uh, Park of uh, Bill Mazeroski, uh, Willie Stargell, and Roberto Clemente. But again, using mixed art forms, she incorporates uh, wire and also if you look very closely these other pieces are wire mesh so there's quite a bit of representation of uh, wire uh, in this piece of work and then finally the united states postal service last year issued a set of commemorative stamps in honor of ruth Akio Oswa, a, an American sculptor. Uh, her work is on uh, uh, display at the, uh, the, the Guggenheim and uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art in, I think it's New York City. And so, you know, there is a lot of, you know, respect for this uh, particular art form. And with that, I will say thank you very much for allowing me to tell you a little bit about myself and how I have been uh, occupying myself for the last uh, 40 years or so. Thank you, David. Why don't you stop the screen share and we'll open it up for questions or comments from uh, the audience. So I never thought of how wire is made. So it's it's a solid state, then turned to a molten state, and then extruded, or? No, that, that was the one thing that I was trying to, I was going to try to show you was how wire is actually made. Now, what I showed you initially was a bar of uh, hot steel that was then being uh, rolled down into a uh, quarter inch or so uh coil of uh, what we call hot rod and then they take that rod and they uh, then draw it uh, into you know a, a finer uh, piece of wire okay. so now if you want thinner wire you would take that wire and you would draw it again uh, uh, the necessary number of uh, reductions you know to get to the uh, final size uh, it's not uncommon that you start with a, uh, 
a piece of uh, rod that's a quarter inch in diameter and you take it down to uh, 0.020 inches in 14 uh, uh, drafts, a draft being uh, one reduction or 14 reductions. And this is uh, quite common. And the speeds are impressive. Uh, when you're uh, a 10 hole, uh, 10 draft machine could be running upwards of 3000 feet a minute. A uh, 14 draft machine be closer to 5000 feet a minute. Almost the speed of light, uh, Gary. <laughs> Any other questions here? Anybody just jump oh, in, unmute, and go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, does that now answer your question, Donna? Rana? You mean Rana? Rana. Kinda. I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up. I'm I'm curious on how the cable was oh. initially formed. And did you have anything to do with like anodized wire? I do a lot of uh, artwork and jewelry with wire. Well, so you're, I never you're, thought about it. Well, copper and aluminum wire are manufactured in very much the same way. So aluminum uh, wire, uh, to, uh, you anodize it uh, with uh, electrical currents in a, uh, an acidic bath. So that would be done uh, prior to it being uh, re-rolled onto a spool. So any other additional questions? Donna yes. Hetrick, go ahead. Yes, I was going to ask David if he has done any playing around with working with wire himself, trying to do art or something else creative, fanciful with it. Uh, yes and no. Uh, do you count uh, uh, rewiring a, a basement with copper wire <laughs> so that it looks neat? <laughs> That gets close, yeah. <laughs> okay, anyone else with a question or comment? Because it's David's birthday. We don't want to uh, keep him too long. And we want to send him off with a happy birthday wish. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, uh, Go ahead, Larry. One, one quick one. Um, years ago, when I was uh, working and living in Wheeling, West Virginia, I was on a state committee for the historic Wheeling Suspension Bridge. And it's a nice ride down there if you ever want to go down. It's the oldest, it, at one point it was the longest iron suspension bridge in the Western Hemisphere. And it has iron wire cables. It's what's supporting it. <laughs> I, did, I just thought I'd throw that out there. <laughs> you had Anyone said else? something about, yeah, um, Cables having to be uh, redone every so often. This uh, they have, <laughs> they have, it was built. It was built right after. Uh, I think it was like around eighteen twenty. I can't remember now, but it was like before they even had steel. It was long before the the uh, Civil War. And as far as I know, they never replaced the wires in it until. Uh, Later, later after our committee met uh, a few times, whatever we did, and uh, they they did have a contract and they did re, uh, redo some of the wires. They repaired it, painted it. Uh, one of the more interesting stories about the bridge is uh, during World War II they ran tanks over it, and it still held up. So <laughs> it's a pretty well built bridge, and the wires were pretty good. Well, mm. what? When they uh, put the uh, uh, those cables together, after the cables are uh, wrapped, uh, they then put a sheaf over it, and then they uh, paint it, and then it's continuously painted uh, every few years uh, just to maintain the integrity. Right. Of the I think that's all they did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the Golden Gate Bridge is also a suspension bridge. Do they replace those cables? No. Again, it's the uh, maintenance. You know, painting it, uh, well, first of all, having the protective sheet around it, and then uh, painting it. Hmm. Okay. Over, else? Uh, okay oh, yeah, over history. How much wire used to come from Pittsburgh? 
was Pittsburgh a major wire producer or did they just make the steel? There were several wire producers in the Pittsburgh area. There was, uh, I can't remember the name, but there was one over in uh, Point Breeze right along the railroad tracks. I think where the, uh, the bus terminal is now. Uh, and there were a few wire uh, mills uh, to the south of Pittsburgh in uh, Washington, Pennsylvania. Uh, but uh, Pittsburgh was primarily a steel sheet. David, this is, th this, yeah, this is Gary. Um, I'm just curious if you want to say a few words about are you still working full time? Do you have plans to retire soon? Uh, do I recall correctly that you're living near Detroit now? Uh, what, what are your what are your near term plans? Well, yes, I am living near Detroit. Uh, I am looking at retirement after the first of the year, and I am still working uh, part time at this point. You, you'll stay in Detroit. Yes, uh, my daughter uh, lives uh, very uh, close by with uh, my granddaughter, and I don't see any reason right now to uh, move elsewhere. Hmm. Sure. Great. Isn't that what family is all about? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Gary, I haven't seen you with this less hair in years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was recently <laughs> assaulted by by my barber. <laughs> my my barber only knows one style, which is too short. <laughs> well, I think you look good, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Anyone Thank else you. have anything to say or question before we conclude? I just yeah, want to say thing. thank you again. Yeah. These are wonderful. I have so much fun doing this. Me too. Okay. Thank so. you. Thanks, David.